<laughs> oh. oh, good morning, everyone. Have to see your Bibles this morning. <laughs> Word. Let's see your pens. Pens. See your lesson plan. Turn to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus 7. Remember, in uh, November 13th, we are having a NP3 building campaign celebration. If you are new and you weren't here last year and we did our building campaign, you want to learn about what's going on with our new building and maybe how you can get involved. On November 13th, we will be at our new site. It will be the first event at our new site, which is right up on Ruffin Road, right up from the stadium. It's about three, four, five minutes from here, literally five minutes from here. And that's November 13th. It's all on your bulletin, all on the website. If you don't know, just go on our website. Also, there is uh, on November 21st, which is the following Sunday. November 13th is a Saturday. Eight days later, November 21st is our first Sunday at our new site. We will not be coming back here. I know we moved a lot and going to come back, going to come back. We are not coming back this time. Uh, we have a permanent place. And we're going to have TV screens all over the room and carpet. It's going to be going to have a little... I think they're working on a little Frappuccino thing. I think. I'm not promising that. but uh, So you can do your frap thing in the back after church. Then we're going to have a um, bookstore, a lot bigger bookstore, uh, with a bunch of books <laughs> and <laughs> book racks. And, you know, it's, we're moving on up. We just looked at the plans for our bookstore at the other building, and it is it's like half the size of this room. It's unbelievable. So we're, gonna, it, it, we're moving on up like George Jefferson. So... Uh, but remember, thir the 13th, please come to, to the celebration, especially if you're new and you haven't been, weren't involved in a building project, you, uh, building campaign. You can see what's going on. And then the 21st, we'll be there permanently. So we only have a few more weeks here. It's going to be very sad. We've been here four and a half years, and the state has been very good to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you four and a half years ago walking in this room. thinking I never thought we'd be here this long, but it's been a blessing. You've done amazing things. And so we just pray uh, that you continue to guide us. And we pray you speak to us today, encourage us today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. many, many years ago, there was a show called Let's Make a Deal. Anybody remember that show? Let's see how many old people we got around. How many people do not remember that show? Okay, very young. I was very, 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 very young when that show came out. I, actually, I think I remember it from my parents talking about it. I don't think I was really alive at the time. But from what I remember them telling me, there was a man named Monty Hall who was the host. And Let's Make a Deal was, a, it was like a Price is Right type show where you, they call people out of the audience and they would ask you if you had a pair of scissors with a blue handle and, and one of the half of the scissors was broken. And if you had that, you can come up and trade it for something. And they asked for all kind of weird things, you know, it was, it was paper clips and you know, a picture of you and your father and the corner of the picture's cut out. It was ridiculous. But if you have whatever they ask for, you can run up on stage and you can give it to Monty Hall, the host, for door number one, door number two, or what was under the, the, in, in the envelope or whatever. And then you would get that and then you would be able to take that and trade that for something else. And so it was just all bargaining. Whenever you negotiate with anybody about anything, there's always two things you must keep in mind. And I want you to say these two things with, you, with me because they are going to apply in your life, to your life, for the rest of your life. Two things. One is price. Say price. price. And terms. Say terms. terms. Say price, price and terms. Whenever you negotiate for anything, price and terms. Go to get a car. How much does the car cost? And what's the car like? $10,000. And what are the terms? You get all the tires. You get the engine. You get all the doors. You get the window. You get a 6 CD changer. What is the pro what's the price and what's the terms? A friend of mine got a free kitchen sink. He does, works on houses, and someone had a kitchen sink they couldn't use, and they just bought it. It was brand new, and he got it for free. Little did he know it was going to cost him a $10,000 kitchen remodel because when he brought it home, his wife said, what would a new sink be doing in my old kitchen? So... <laughs> In terms, when you go to college, how much, is the, how much is tuition and what do I get for that? Do I get dorms? Do I get books? You always want to know the price and you always want to know the terms. Now, the price is what you give. And we're talking generality here. The price is what you give and the terms are the conditions of what you get. The price is what you give and the terms are the conditions on what you get. You can give, your price could be a thing. It doesn't have to be money. You can give up one car to get another car. You can give up 
uh, you know, one boyfriend to get another boyfriend. So, you know, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be money. It's just whatever you give is what's going to cost you. What you get and the conditions of what you get are the terms of the deal. Price and terms. In today's story, God makes an offer to Pharaoh. Terms. I want my people. What I want to give you is an opportunity to learn that I am the baddest God there is. <laughs> I want to give you an opportunity to get to know me, Pharaoh. I want to give you an opportunity to have a lesson on divine authority. (laughs) That's what I'm going to give you. And what I want in return, I want all my peoples, I want their children, I want all their animals, and I'm also going to take all your gold and silver as well. Those are the terms. And what I'm going to give you to get that is I'm going to give you a lesson on divine authority. (laughs) Now, God has offered us a deal, too. He has offered us a deal. The the price, what he wants to give us, is eternal life. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you abundant life. He wants to give you life. Because when you accept Christ your Savior, eternal life starts now. I'm already eternal. I'm never going to die. Now, my body will go into the grave, but I'm not going to die. And if you have Christ in your life, you have already started eternity. And what you have to give up for that is control of your life, your pride. Everything your pride is holding on to. So God says, I'm going to pay you. It's a gift, by the way. But I'm going I'm to give you something to get something. And what I'm going to give you is life. And what I want to get from you is all your junk, your sin, your pride, your arrogance, your pain. And all that comes with that. That seems like a good deal, amen? I want to encourage you today to make a deal. Make the deal. Now, some of you are not saved. It's a very simple make the deal. Ask Christ to be your Savior. Take from him eternal life and give to him all your junk. Many of us have already asked Christ to be our Savior. We're still holding on to stuff. Give it up. You have made the deal. Give it up. Now, two things about negotiating with God. Well, three things. Don't negotiate with God. You always lose. <laughs> but two things I want to point out. One, God is a willing, a willing buyer. He wants to make the deal. In this story you're going to look at, God is going to beat Pharaoh down. He's going to beat down Egypt. He doesn't want to do that to you. He wants to make a deal today. So what we see in this story, how how God continues to beat Pharaoh down, and if you read the story, we're not going to read all of it because it's too much text. He says he hardens Pharaoh's heart. He does not want you to go through what Pharaoh went through. The other thing about negotiating with God The longer you wait to make the deal, the more you suffer. The longer you put off making this deal, the longer you suffer. Now, the Egyptians had many gods. They had not only had many different gods, each god had many of them. Like we're going to see in a minute, the frog, the toad was a a god. There was a whole lot of them. The, The ox, there was a whole lot of them. So not only did they have different gods, they had many of them. And the word for God that they used was Elohim. It's a plural form of the word God, El. And God is going to prove through this process that he is the supreme Elohim. So as lo- the longer you wait, the longer God has the opportunity to prove to you that he's God. And he does that by destroying what you worship. So therefore, the longer you wait, the more destruction that's going to happen in your life. And so make the deal today. Don't keep waiting and keep trying to uh, uh, bargain with God and say, well, I'll wait one more year. When I first accepted Christ, I waited five years before I really surrendered. In other words, I prayed the prayer, but I really didn't give up control. And I kept putting off, well, hey, one more party, one more this, one more that. And God said, okay, but the longer you wait, the longer you're going to suffer and the, and, and the more damage you're going you're gonna to experience. And sometimes that damage cannot be repaired. You could be destroyed without, without an opportunity to be repaired. You see, you see people who, are, who are, have used drugs for a long time. They, they can get healed and delivered, but sometimes the scars are forever in their body or in their face and in their life. Okay, let's, do, let's look at our Bibles, chapter 7, verse 14. Chapter 7, verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refused to let the people go. Actually, let's look at our map. I'm sorry. Let's look at our map real quick. Let's get a review. Moses is down there talking to the fire. God tells Moses, go go to Pharaoh. He goes up to Egypt, and he's going to confront Pharaoh, and they're going to have a conversation. This conversation is going to last 
Nine months. And he's going to say, let my people go. Let my people go. Okay, let's look at our Bibles. Chapter 7, verse 14. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refused to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to water. You shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned into a serpent you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod which is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die. The river will, low, will stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. First, you have to acknowledge God's absolute power over all gods and make the deal. Acknowledge that God is more powerful than all gods and make the deal with him. Give up your life. Now, the Nile River was a god. Hapi, H-A-P-I. It was the, the god of the Nile. They worshipped the Nile because of the water that they drank, the water that they used for everything that water is used for. They, they worshipped the Nile for the fish that was in it, therefore the life that the Nile provided for them. It was big. It was also considered the blood of another god. They worshipped this, this river. God said, watch me, I have power over all your gods, and he turned the river to blood. The Egyptians loathed, hated blood. When they punished the Jews, they would sprinkle blood on them as a form of punishment because they hated blood. So what God says, I'm going to take this God of yours, this little idol of yours, and I'm going to turn it into something you hate, proving that I am all-powerful over all your gods. Do you know that whatever you worship today, whatever your idol is today, God is more powerful than it? Do you realize that? Do you believe that? Do you accept that? Some of you don't because you trust in it first when you get in trouble. You don't go to God. You trust in it when things are going good. You don't go to God. God is more powerful than all those things. And one of the ways you can test that if you doubt that, first decide what it is. Is it money, sex, power, your own intelligence, your education, your, your, your 401k, whatever it is. Whatever you trust in it, go home today and say, God, this is more powerful than you. That's all you got to say. Just say that and then step back, <laughs> get a pen out and a paper, and watch what happens. So if, something, if, you, if, you, if there's something in your life that you think that is more powerful than God and more influential on your happiness than God, say that to God. Uh, say it about that to God. God, this is more powerful and more influential in my life than you. And if it's not, show me. If you're really bold, you can say that. Now, you may be saying, I would never say that to God. Then if, then if you would never say that to God, stop trusting in that thing. God says, no, I'm more powerful. Look at chapter 7, verse 21. It says, the fish that were in the river died. The river stank. The Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, so there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew, grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went in his house. Neither was his heart moved. You know what the Bible says? God changed the river to blood, and Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing. So Pharaoh says, my magicians can do the same thing you can do, so why should I follow you? If you ever witness to somebody say, God can give you happiness, God can give you peace, God can give you purpose, some will say to you, I already got that. I got money. I got peace. I got purpose. I don't need God. You ever hear that? Same thing. Why do I need God if I can get that on my own? You really can't get that on your own. You have a false version of the purpose God can give you. You have a false version of the peace God can give you. I'm not saying you can't be happy without God. Or I'm, let me say that again. I'm not saying you can't experience happiness or get a good laugh and, not have, and, and live without pain and misery. I'm not saying you can't do that, but it's temporary, and it's not as the quality God can give you. But the key word, it's temporary. Don't be fooled to trick. You can provide yourself with the same thing God can provide you because God can provide you joy that comes from within, independent of everything from without, independent of money, purpose, I mean, uh, 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 accolades from people, uh, uh, a good job, independent of all that, he can provide peace, and he can provide you eternal life. You can't get that from anywhere. 
Number two, acknowledge God's, acknowledge the stank, S-T-A-N-K, N-K. Not the stank. See, if something smells bad, you may say, oh, that stinks. But when something really stinks, you say it stinks. Amen? It's like if someone comes up here and sings a sight song, ah, nah, nah. oh, they can sing. But if someone comes here and breaks it down, you would say they can sing. I know it's incorrect English grammatical thing, but it's still, it's kind of an ebonic thing, but you get the point, okay? <laughs> they can sing. Well, you got to acknowledge the stank of death your idol can bring and make the deal with God. Acknowledge the stank and make the deal with God. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let my people go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, your bedroom, your bed, your houses of your servants, on your peoples, in your ovens, in your kneading bowls. God is very specific. I'm going to send frogs everywhere. Now you have to understand, they worship the frog. Heka was the, uh, the goddess of fertility. So God said, watch me multiply all these little fertile frogs so much that you are going to hate them. What is it that you worship? You know, God can give you or the devil can give you so much of it, you'll hate it. I was watching uh, this morning, I was watching ESPN. I was working out and they had a show on, um, it's 24 hours a day, by the way, ladies. It's 24 hours a day. It's, and it's good 24 hours a day. Uh, it was a show called Outside the Lines. It was on Ken Caminiti. Sad, sad, sad. They, they interviewed the people who he was with when he died. Drug dealers from New York City. And they showed the apartment where he was, the neighborhood where he was, a place he shouldn't have been. And I'm looking at this, this neighborhood, and I'm thinking this guy that made $40 million in his career, MVP. I mean, he had it all. And the devil was so good. The devil says, I'm going to give you a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit. And it was good for a while. Sin is fun for a while. But I'm going to give you so much of what you want, it will kill you. You want money? Money, you will chase money right off the cliff. You want sex? You ever heard of sex addiction? It will ruin your whole life. You want drugs? Go ahead. And it's a little bit at a time. The devil's not going to tell you when he gets you involved that it's gonna, he's going to ruin you with it. I was, I was at a gym a few months ago running on this treadmill. And this lady was on the bicycle next to me. And I never didn't meet her, but I, you know, I talked to people all the time, and I said, uh, and she was drinking coffee on the bike. <laughs> so I got on the treadmill, I looked at her, I said, what are you doing? You're drinking coffee on your bike, you might as well be smoking a cigarette. And she, oh, she's laughing. Well, the next time I saw her, it was the next week, she brought me a little box of those fake cigarettes with the gum in it. <laughs> and I, I, I put it in my car, I probably still got it, there's probably been like six months, I just leave it there, but... It's, it's the kind of cigarettes that when you're a little kid, you, you, I don't know why they have this. But, you know, it's gum and you put it in your mouth, you fake like you're smoking and you blow and powder comes out. Now, it seems like, oh, it's, a little, it's gum. I promise you, Satan had a meeting and, and invented that. I promise you. Why? Because, oh, just, it's harmless. Well, next thing you know, you get a real cigarette. And next thing you know, you get a funny cigarette. And you stop letting, and when that's not funny anymore, you get cocaine. Next thing you know, you get heroin. That's how the devil works. So he says, listen, I'll just keep giving you more. Why? Because it's not really hurting you. And so God says, you want to worship the frog? I'm going to give you so much frog, you ain't going to like it. <laughs> what he's going to prove to you is that this thing that you worship is not really worthy of being worshipped. Because the more you get it, the more it kills you. That is not true with God. Look at chapter, thir- chapter 8, verse 13. It says, the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died in the houses of the, uh, and the houses out in the courtyards and out in the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. <laughs> and when Pharaoh saw it, there was relief. He hardened his heart and did not heed as the Lord had said. You know what Pharaoh did? As soon as the stank went away. Oh, I don't need God. How often do we go, oh, God, please, I got a problem, I got a problem. Oh, please. And as soon as the problem goes away, what happens? We don't pray anymore. Some of y'all in church today only because you got a problem. Now, thank you that you're here, but when your problem goes away, don't leave. Just keep coming to church. Don't get settled with life being, oh, pretty good. Test to see how good God can make your life. 
Don't just come when there's problems because you're going to be like Pharaoh. Oh, relief comes? Because, by the way, right before the frogs got went away, Pharaoh says, oh, I'll, I'll let you guys go. But as soon as the frog problem went away, he changed his mind. Pharaoh changed his mind five times, by the way. I'll let you go. Oh, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to let you go and believe your kids. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to let you go but leave your cattle. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to let you go but stay in our land. I'm not going to let you go. He kept going back and forth, and we do that with God. God, I'll, I'll take the deal. No, I won't take the deal. I'll give my life to you, but I'm not going to give my life to you. Stop that. Give your life to God. Make the deal. Number three, acknowledge God's ability to distinguish between the punished and the delivered and make the deal with God. God can distinguish between who gets punished and who does not. Look at chapter 8, verse 20. The Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and on your people and in your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies and also the ground in which they stand. And in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that they may know that I am the Lord in the midst of of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people Tomorrow, this sign shall be. Now, there are some people who say all these signs and these miracles and these plagues were all natural phenomenon. It wasn't God at all. People always try to explain away the supernatural because they want to try to explain away God. But you know what God does in anticipation of that because he knew people would grow up and be smart and try to, you know, spin it around? He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I'm going to send flies, but they're only going to be in the houses of the Egyptians. Explain that. They're flying. Oh, these are, these are Hebrews. We can't go in there. They're going. No, no, no. Only God can do that. God knew. God knew. He, he anticipated. He says, what, what, what God do is that I can distinguish between flies going in your house, but not your house. I can distinguish between those who are really my children and those who are not. God does not see like man sees. We look at the outward. God looks at the heart. God can look around this room right now. And he knows which ones really love him, which ones really have, have surrendered, and which ones have not. Some people play church. Go to church every now and then, and I'll sit there, word, Jesus, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Whew, I'm set, I'm cool, I'm going out, I'm safe. God says, no, 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 I know who, which ones are mine. When I call, my sheep come. The Bible says, he who has the son has life, he who does not have the son does not have life. It's very simple. How do you have the son? You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and you surrender your will to him. Holding on to nothing, by the way. I'm going to be a Christian, but I'm going to be this kind of Christian. I'm going to get saved, but I'm going to do it this way. No, there's only one way. It's right here. God's terms are very clear. <laughs> They're not negotiable. They're not negotiable. You can't be a Christian your way. When Cain was going to give, Cain killed his brother Abel. God asked for a sacrifice. Cain gave a sacrifice he wanted, not the sacrifice he was taught by his parents to give. He didn't shed blood. He gave some of his crops that he grew up. And God said, no, 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 I don't accept that. And Cain got angry because God didn't accept his sacrifice, and he killed his brother. The reason Cain had a problem with his brother, because he had a problem with God. The reason he had a problem with God, he was trying to do Christianity his own way. God said, no, you do it my way. You go hit the highway. God can distinguish. He distinguished, and I'll just, if, you, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. He distinguished in chapter 9, verse 4, where he killed only the livestock of the Hebrews. He distinguished when he, he made darkness come over the land. The Bible says a darkness so dark you can feel it. Ra was the sun god. Ra was the god of Pharaoh himself. They believed that Ra was the physical daddy of Pharaoh. It wasn't, but they thought that. So what God did is says, listen, Ra, your big god up there, I'm going to close off the sun for three days. You will have no light, and there will be no light in your house. Well, it could have been a solar eclipse. Well, all the lights they had in the houses went out, in the lamps, and there was light in the Hebrew homes. How do you explain that? 
When he killed the livestock, only the livestock of the, of the Egyptians died, and the livestock of the Hebrews didn't die. How do you explain that? God can distinguish. God can separate the sheep from the goats. You cannot hide from God. I don't know if you remember as a kid. Some of y'all as a kid, you might have snuck in the basketball game in high school. Stuck in the movies. You know, sneaking in something is, uh, is kind of uh, something we probably all try. Amen. Amen, anybody? You try to sneak in something, right? You weren't invited. You know, someone's house. They didn't want you there. And you kind of uh, with the crowd. Are you with me? You can't do that with heaven. Can't, can't be in line in heaven, and everyone's walking in line. Uh, welcome, welcome. Come on in. Welcome, welcome. You're coming in line. Hey, how you doing? Praise the Lord. Hey, ha, ha, ha. No, 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 it's me. You know, I, I went to the rock. Jesus, word. Hey, who's the man, right? <laughs> the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ, sincerely, your name was written in the book. So let's check the book. You ain't in here. Let's check the other book. God can distinguish between his people and those who are not his people. Number four, God can acknowledge, you need to acknowledge God's ability to determine the timing of his judgments. The timing. Acknowledge that God can time out any, a blessing or a curse, a punishment or a discipline, and make the deal with God and give your life to him. He's offering you freedom from all these plagues. He's offering you an opportunity to walk with him. He's offering you an opportunity to know him. And all you got to do is say, God, I'm not going to worship anything else because I see you can judge everything I honor. You can judge everything I worship. And believe me, there is nothing in your life worshiping that God accepts. In other words, you can't, you can't say, well, I'm, I'm doing a good thing and God will understand. No, he won't because there's no good thing that's gooder than worshiping God. Nothing. Nothing. I, I made a comment last week, and I made it several times before, but since many of you weren't here because this is a big turnover, I'll say it again. You can even worship motherhood. I'm going to take care of my kids. I love my kids. And, 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 but, but at the same time, you can put too much in that, though it's a very noble thing. What does that mean? That God gets put on the shelf for 18 years till your kids move out. That's where it's no good. You even, have to, you even have to appropriate that because those kids are God's kids. You need to spend your time with God. So that even things that we would say are good things can become idols in our life, idols that God is against. We don't want to do that. We want to say, Lord, here I am. Chapter, chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. Chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. The Lord said to Moses, go into, the, go into Pharaoh and tell him, thus saith the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle, in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the ox, on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And a difference will be made, will, uh, and the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. And look what it says. The Lord appointed a set time. Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing. I'm going to send a disease tomorrow at a specific time. How does someone break out with a cold at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> and that get predicted. Because God can do anything he wants. Anytime he wants, through whomever he wants, any way he wants. He can distinguish between the people who are his and the people who are not his. You ever, have you ever had, you needed some money and time was running out and at the last minute God came through? Say amen if you don't talk about God was waiting the whole time. He had it in his hand. And he just sat there and waited. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Are you going to pray? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to complain? Are you going to cry? Are you going to wear people out? Tick, tock, tick. And he just waited. Let me go help somebody else while I wait because you got another hour. And he go over here and do this. And right when things start to fall apart, he goes, boop. He's time. He's on time. God is never late, by the way. Late is a, is a, is a, is a uh, 
It's our perception. We have our desires. God is always on time because God doesn't operate in time. <laughs> Everything's now to God. He is always on time. He knows just how much you can take. He, he can distinguish the timing. Number five, acknowledge God's merciful escape opportunities. Merciful escape opportunities. Now, before I talk about this one, I want you to go to number six. And I want you to write down, acknowledge sin's ability to completely destroy everything in your life. Just write that down, number six. And then number seven. Number seven, I want you to write down, acknowledge God as the only source of light. And we're gonna, I'm going to deal with number six. I'm going to come back to number five. Sorry about the jumping around. Chapter 10. Listen to that sound. <laughs> I was at a class the other day at a, uh, um, at a Bible college teaching. I'm an adjunct professor. <laughs> and I went around the class asking people who, who was there and what they were there for, what church they go to, what their ministry. And then one lady says, um, I go to this church and... Uh, Someone from my staff, I don't know if it was a senior pastor or not, came and visited. And he came back. He was all excited and talked about how you guys have Bibles in church. I said, say that again? She said, it was, you guys have Bibles in church and you hold them up. I said, yeah, well, you know, we, we kind of just got a special revelation from God that we should use our Bibles. <laughs> I say that jokingly because we take for granted that we have Bibles in church. But a lot of churches don't use Bibles. I... I, I I don't get it. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. But they don't. So when you hear that sound, you know, again, it's a great sound, but you can go to some churches that they don't use the Bible. They may talk about the Bible. They may even put one verse up, but people don't carry the Bibles. They don't use it. They don't learn about it. So it's a, it's, I, don't, I don't get that, but it happens a lot. Chapter 10, verse 3. Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else if you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail that shall grow up of every tree which grows for you out of the ground. They shall fill your houses. The houses of your servants, the houses of the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Moses, can you imagine Moses? Pharaoh, let my people go or there's going to be locusts like you ain't never seen before. <laughs> They're going to cover the ground and everything the hail destroyed, <clears throat> the locusts are going to eat the rest. Number six in your notes, acknowledge sin's ability to completely destroy everything in your life. Make the deal with God. The longer you wait, the more of your life will get eaten up by your sin. The longer your life will get eaten up by your idols. Now, don't be deceived that if you have things, this is not happening to you. <laughs> because your things could be your locust. What does that mean? You can have things and have no happiness, have no purpose, and have no eternal destiny with God. So what do you have? Nothing. You just have nice locusts, <laughs> clean locusts, gold-plated locusts, but they're still locusts. And God will, God will use what you worship to destroy you, and just because you get more of it, don't think that God's blessing you. Don't think God's blessing you. Now turn to number five in your notes. This is the one I want to end on. Acknowledge God's ability, God's merciful escape opportunities, and make the deal with God. Chapter 9, verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 18 says, Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause very, a very heavy hail to rain down such has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Nut, N-U-T, was the sky goddess. 
and the sky supposedly brought harvest time. Well, God is going to turn nut into a nut and send down hail to destroy the very thing that nut was supposed to cause to grow. He is going to reverse the power of nut and use it to destroy everything they need to eat. But look what God does. Verse 19. Therefore now, send and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every beast which is found in the field and is not brought in the home, and they shall die. He who feared, or she who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh, made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. You know what God says? I'm warning all of y'all. You sainted the, the, the lice, you sainted the blood, the boils, the frogs, the stank. You sainted all that, right? Hell's coming. <laughs> For us, hell is coming. It's coming. If you want to escape hell, or hell, however you want to say it, if you want to escape death, go in the house. Now, some of the Egyptians says, Please, all that stuff was a coincidence. All that stuff was accent. God didn't do all that. But some of the Egyptians says, no, I think that brother's been doing, I think he's real. Because I still got the, the, the bumps all over my body. I still got the lights in my hair. I still got the froggy stank in my house. I'm going in the house. <laughs> now, there's some people that say there's no God. There's some people who say there's no God. Death is not real. I'm, when I die, I'm going to come back as a toad. I'm going to come back as a queen. I'm going to come back. There's some people who think all that. There's some people who think that, that everything you see outside is just an accident. There's no divine creator. There's no absolute right or wrong. We can do whatever we want. And God loves everybody and to the point that he will forgive everybody of everything, no matter what they do. Without accepting Christ, by the way. He's just, that's the way it is. Now, I don't know where you get that information, but that is not in the Bible. None of that. God is a God of, he's very fair, he's very righteous. And because he's righteous, he has to keep his word. And his word is this, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, the penalty is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He has to keep his word. So he's saying to you, if you want hell, do your own thing. But if you want heaven, accept me as your savior, make the deal. Here's the deal, let me repeat it again. I want to take from you all control of your life. I need control. I want to take from you all your burden. I want to take from you the penalty of your sin. And I want to give you eternal life. That's a good deal. Now, if you want hell, hold on to everything you got and deal with your own life. But if you want heaven, make the deal. So right now I'm going to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes and listen very closely. Dear Lord, we saw, if we read this story more closely, which I encourage everyone to do when you get home, Pharaoh kept changing his mind. He kept changing the terms of the deal. He wanted to let the people go, but they had to leave their children. He wanted to let the people go, but they had to leave their animals. He wanted to let the people worship, but they had to do it in Egypt. But your terms are very clear. They must leave three days' journey and worship everybody and everything. Your terms are clear to us today. You want our entire life. You want us to live according to your word. And you want to give us in return eternal life, abundant life, forgiveness, a relationship with you. The longer we wait, the more painful and costly the deal will be. Many of you have waited long enough. You've experienced enough pain to know God is God. You've experienced enough pain to know you're never going to beat him. You're never going to win. So today, if you want to make the deal with God, receive from him what he has to offer you. Life, abundant, life eternal. 
pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I believe I'm a sinner. And right now I'm in control. I worship things other than you. Lord, please forgive me. Please receive me today as your child. Please give me that life you speak of. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to make that deal with you today. I don't want to bargain. I'm not going to renege later on. Please be my God. As the eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand, and after that I'm going to ask you to come forward. But if you prayed that prayer, what you just told God is, God, I no longer belong to myself. I belong to you. And voluntarily I will do what you ask. By faith, not knowing how it's going to work out, that is the deal. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sin, and the small thing I can do in return is just to obey you. So right now, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer and you're saying this morning, yes, here I am, God, let's make the deal. I'm going to ask you to stand up to your feet right now, right where you're sitting. Just stand right where you're at. Stand up to your feet and acknowledge his forgiveness in your life this morning. God bless you. Stay standing good. God bless you. Very good. Stand up to your feet and acknowledge Christ in your life. Anybody else? God has spoken to you. God bless you. Very good. Stay standing. Good. God bless you. God bless you, too. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? God has spoken to you. Yes, God bless you. Very good. Very good. God bless you. You're saying to God, God, no more running, no more negotiating, no more bargaining. Here I am. I accept your terms and your price. Anybody else? Now we're going to ask all you who are standing to do one more thing as we welcome you to the family of God. We're going to ask you to step out of your feet and come on down to the altar. Let's give them a hand as they come on down. Amen. Right here. Stand right there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> How you doing? Amen. Who's the man this morning? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God says if you confess, he is faithful to forgive. God has forgiven all your sin. He has a plan for your life. Lord, I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for the faith and courage of these people. And Lord, I pray none of us would negotiate with you anymore. Try to cut corners on what you ask us to do. Try to take shortcuts to what you ask us to do. That by faith we would trust you are God Almighty, the Elohim we need to worship. And that all other Elohims, all other Elohim, I should say, all other gods and idols are nothing. They're false. They don't work. And if you're listening to my voice and you think, well, there's something in my life that I think is more powerful, as powerful, as beneficial, go home today. Or even right now, after I finish running my mouth, say to God, God, I think this God and my idol in my life is powerful. Ask God to prove himself more powerful. And then get out of the way. Watch what he does. Lord, I pray you do that to people's lives. I pray you do that to some people right here who are not even asking that question. But I pray you show yourself strong in their life today. That they would stop waiting because the longer they wait, the more they suffer. And the more blessings they lose out on. Lord, I pray next week as we watch the Passover, the last plague, where the firstborn of every child, every family and the firstborn of every animal's family dies. Except those that had the blood of the lamb on the door. Teach us how Passover was just a, a foreshadow of what you would do for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask all y'all to walk that way to that guy. He's going to give you something. Just make a left at that corner. Let's give them a hand as they walk out. God bless you.